Well, welcome to the Garden Calendar uh, this month of November. Uh, it's early November and still a lot of uh, pretty color on the trees. You can see in the leaves around me. Um, we're going to cover a lot of things today. We're going to talk about some things you can still do in the garden, some things you can do in your yard, some things you can plant, um, some chores, uh, getting ready for winter. Uh, so a lot of little things we can still do uh, as gardeners in the month of November. Also, we're going to uh, visit um, uh, one of our favorite master gardeners that have a ver quite a variety of Japanese maples um, up on Barrett's Mountain. And then we're going to also uh, visit uh, one of our beekeepers, Danny Price, and uh, work a little bit with his bees. Uh, show what goes on in the fall working with our, our honeybee growers. So... I uh, do want to mention there are still some things uh, that are pretty in the month of November. Um, mums, of course, are uh, in bloom now. Witch hazels, hazels, some of those are in bloom. Some of the camellias. Uh, colorful berries, a lot of colorful berries out there. American beautyberry, nandina, pyracantha, uh, dogwoods, some Washington hawthorn. And then, of course, uh, a lot of our hollies have beautiful berries. So a lot of pretty color out there uh, in the month of November. And I um, hope you get, get to a chance to enjoy some of it. Well, here in the month of November, for, your, for you gardeners, there's still a few things we can plant. Um, of course, we did mention last month that October is probably the best month of the year to plant uh, trees or shrubs that are in containers or uh, maybe even move some transplants. But November is a good month as well. So if you didn't get those plants uh, planted out in the yard, your, your trees or some, some young trees or some shrubs, um, November would still be a good month to do that, so go right ahead. Also, uh, you can still plant some pansies. They might not get uh, quite the growth uh, bef before they slow down in the very cold months, but uh, they'll survive. So if you want to plant pansies, you can still uh, get them out. Um, also, um, there's a few things. Uh, you can still plant some uh, bulbs, too, as far, far, as far as that goes. Your spring flowering bulbs. October's better but you can still put them out in the month of November. And then finally, garden. Uh, it's too late for a lot of things, but there's a few things that you still can plant in your garden. They're going to get going and kind of go slow down in the coldest part of the uh, year, but uh, then they'll pick back up and do some rapid growing in the spring. But, and that, but that is onions and garlic. So we're going to plant a few onions and garlic. Uh, we actually have with us, um, you know, some, some garlic and they, form them usually in cluster bulbs or you can actually get garlic cloves from the grocery store and you could divide those into you know the small little individual cloves off that one bulb and plant those and you can also plant onions here we have I believe some Egyptian onions or walking onions we'll plant a few of those so any kind of onions can be planted this month as well Well, in the month of November, uh, there's a lot of garden chores that the home gardener can do. Um, one of those is uh, soil test. Uh, November is a great month to take soil samples um, in your garden or in your lawn. Um, you know, it really gets busy down at the soil lab in the spring, so fall, you can get your samples back real quick and you'll know about lime, that type of thing. They'll actually give you your recommendation for your blend in the spring based on what what it's for lawn landscape garden so come by the extension office get soil test boxes and directions for that also the month of november um, it's a great time to straighten up your garden shed i know you've been working hard out of that all year long and things may have got kind of in disarray or uh, not in the organized fashion you'd like for it to be uh, still warm warm enough to get out there and work um, so while you've got some time go out there and get that garden shed straightened up also your garden tools uh, if they're dull or a little rusty you know sharpen those uh, put some oil or lubricant on and get them working properly uh, get them ready for next spring also your garden hoses 
before winter sets in. Drain your garden hoses. Unhook them, uh, roll them up to store them, and, and drain those uh, before it freezes. And then, you know, you've got a lot of, uh, you know, the frost are starting to kill back some of the perennials around your house, your, also your garden. So, you know, pull up the old uh, garden plants, uh, add them to your compost pile. Uh, also, if you've got some leaves you're raking up, you know, mix everything in and, uh, you know, you'll have a lot of great uh, broken down compost, basically a really rich soil that you can use for other things next spring. So a lot of chores you can do in November, uh, so get out there and tackle some of them. Okay, as far as uh, the lawn goes, there's still some things you can do out there in the lawn. If it uh, continues to grow, uh, keep your grass mowed, but just don't get, you know, keep it that good three or four inches in height. Um, you know, it just carries on more photosynthesis. Uh, you have more leaf area. It's going to make those roots stronger and healthier. Um, if you did not get out your fertilizer in October, it's still not too late. You can put your fertilizer, your fall application out in November. And really, uh, if you want to do what's absolutely best, you can put a slow-release fertilizer would be better. It actually... That nitrogen that's slowly releasing helps the uh, your cool season lawns stay greener longer in the fall and winter. And actually, that slow release will be giving it nitrogen early in the spring. It'll actually green up a little quicker. So slow release fertilizer is a great idea for the lawn. Well, in the month of November, another thing you can do for you wildlife enthusiasts is to uh, clean out your birdhouses. Um, uh, it's always great to put some birdhouses out there, whether they're for bluebirds or uh, whatever you may be putting them out there for sparrows, wrens, uh, chickadees, whatever may be using them. Uh, but end of the year, they're not uh, having an active nest, so they're, they're vacated, so you can clean them out. You know, most of them usually have a hatch or a bottom that, that you can remove, clean out the old nesting material, and uh, then close it back up. And that leaves a clean burn ho birdhouse for the next flock that'll come in next spring. Now, another thing I want to mention is, um, you know, a lot of us do put out bird feeders and uh, bird seed uh, in the fall or winter. And that's a great idea. If you start that process, please keep it up because you don't want the birds to start depending on that source of food and then it dry up in February or something and then they really are kind of in bad shape. So, if you start something, continue it. But right now, and still in November, October and November, there's usually a lot of seeds and berries out there for the birds. They're really probably not going to hit your bird feeders very much. Um, you know, the birds really uh, are looking for kind of scrounging and to get the hard, hard to find food, usually when winter really sets in. And that may be December 1st of the year. But, uh, you know, if you put bird seed out there, you may have a few that are going to hit it. But not like uh, uh, you probably saw last winter. So uh, don't get all anxious if you don't see a lot of birds at your bird feeder in the month of November because it's probably not going to be till late December or January till they really start hitting the bird feeders really hard. Well, another thing you can do in the month of November is after all of the leaves have fallen, uh, you want to get those leaves up off of your lawn because if the grass stays, grass stays covered up, uh, it, the leaves will actually kill the grass. It'll shut off the photosynthesis and they will die. So um, if your leaves are pretty thick, you need to get in here and rake or you know, use a leaf blower or whatever you've got. But uh, if you've got a good lawn, you want to keep it healthy, you need to get those leaves up off the lawn. The leaves can go in your compost pile or till them into your garden or whatever, but uh, they've got some good organic amendment and use them uh, to help benefit you next spring. Well, here we are still in the month of November, um, and we've got some special guests with us here today, and they're going to give us a kind of a tour of their wonderful gardens here. This is Bill and Paula Phillips, and they're some of my master gardeners that have taken the master gardener class. Do you remember how many years ago it was? Gosh. Ten years ago. Well, yeah. If Bill says ten, it's ten. So, <laughs> it's, so it's Bill and Paula, and they're going to um, tell you a little bit about some of the plants that are right here behind them. They've got some gorgeous plants still up here in the month of November. This is insomnia. Um, it blooms little blue flowers in the spring and turns this brilliant gold in the fall. 
And next to it is a chrysanthemum that's been here since we bought this place. Um, and it blooms like this every year. Um, and down at the bottom are some little petunias. Well, Bill has a lot of Japanese maples, Bill and Paula, so I'm going to let Bill tell you how many he has and talk a little bit about the one he has in his hands here. Um, overall, I think we have about 160 Japanese maple cultivars. We've been trying to put most of them in the ground, but there's still plenty left in pots. And this is one in a pot. This is um, Red Feathers, and he's the daintiest, uh, most delicate maple that I have. Um, when he's full grown, he won't be three foot tall as a full grown tree. And he will always be this very dainty leaf with a, a burgundy, orangey fall color. We're going to take a look now at some of the maples in the yard. This is a red dragon, a dissectum uh, weeper type. Uh, over in the pot next to the house is a Shana. Uh, probably going to leave that in the pot. Some of them do very well in pots and some do not. Um, got another one in the pot back here that's uh, bald smith. It's in some nice fall color, so we'll take a look at that too. This is an Acer Grissom uh, paper bark maple, and its claim to fame is being the exfoliating bark. Um, as it gets older, it'll peel off the bark continuously year round, and ultimately that'll be a 25 foot tree probably. We're looking at the Acer. Palmatum Osakazuki. Uh, this is uh, one of the most spectacular fall red colors that's not red yet. He's just getting started making his change, but he will turn fire truck red. Um, that tree was probably 10 years old when we put it in, so it's probably a 20, 22 year old tree now. And the goal was to fill up the living room window here with those red leaves. Um, won't be too long, much longer now. In the back part of our yard and this tree here is called pixie it's a um, dwarf tree it'll only get like five or six foot tall and it'll be vase shaped and right now it's gorgeous we're just going to pan around uh, the backyard here and take a look at a few things there's a mugo pine on a stick as we call it it's a little short green thing uh, a weeping spruce that continues to get taller. Not enough weeping, but he's getting more height. Uh, beside him is a big Laura Patellum. And then as we head on around, there's some giant birch trees, and then there's a Viburnum. Uh, I think it's Allegheny Viburnum. Uh, they smell great when they bloom. Behind him is a Sangu Kaku, the coral bark maple tree. Uh, he's pretty much gone rust on all his color this year and in the winter he'll have red bark that's what makes him stand out is his red bark in the winter uh, then we have a large nanchez crepe myrtle uh, he'll bloom white and they crepe myrtles are some of the best fall color going right now uh, to the right of him is a, a weeping red bud called traveler and Behind him is a blue spruce. Uh, the blue spruce has been there all oh, 10 years now. Most, most all of these have been in this part of the yard 10 years or less. Uh, to the right in the front is a, another viburnum. It's a snowball bush is the only name we can ever come up with. Uh, back behind him is a peach tree and then to the right of him is a, another maple tree called Japanese maple called Hagoku. Uh, he should be an upright, large, turns orange in the fall maple tree. To his right is a Yoshino cherry, who's already putting on his orange colors for the fall. And he was large when we put him in, but he's been in the ground 10 years. So 11 years, maybe. Uh, to the right of him, we have uh, ba mm. emerald lace, I think it's called. Um, and to the right, deep in to the back, is a dawn redwood turning um, nice yellow gold. And sitting behind those are the euonymus, the burning bush, a string of burning bushes. And then over on the, the far end, we have a, a weeping cherry. Um, that 
flowers nicely full of white flowers in the spring. And then on the corner over there is a, a hemlock that so far has avoided the woody adelgia. And he's looking good. And we're going to take a look at another maple in the backyard. But I want, first I wanted to show you the typical look of a tree that you buy at Lowe's or Home Depot. It's just a little whip, a singular trunk uh, that one day becomes a tree. The vitifolium over here came that way when I bought him. He was a single trunk tree, but in, and I had a nice big base on him, nice big trunk. In 07, we had the Easter freeze, and he died back to just about to the ground. And now you see how he's come back out as a multi-trunked tree. That's why a lot of times you'll see maple, old maples that have that multi-trunk look. Nobody really cut them back to the ground to make them do it that way. They just died back because of the uh, early freezes or trying to out, sometimes they'll outgrow their root systems and they'll break in the snow. And, but this one is developing some very, very nice fall color. Well, we stopped to take a look at a Leonard Leobium uh, type maple. This one is called Hub's Red Willow. It's a very strap-like leaf, uh, dainty fingery looking type leaves. And that one I bought off eBay in 03, so that's a nine-year-old tree. It was a one-year graft, so he's been there nine years, and that's what you get in nine years with a Japanese maple tree. They're slow growers. We're looking at another Japanese maple here called Burgundy Flame. It's some nice fall color. It's uh, pretty much a typical uh, maple tree, Japanese maple tree. He'll be 12 to 15 foot tall and, and spread about as much. Uh, the typical maple gets about the size of a, a nice dogwood and tends to take on the same sort of shape. Uh, this one's going to do it. We're looking at the Atropurpurum uh, Japanese maple. It's basically the species tree of the maples. Uh, most Japanese maple trees, when you buy them, they're grafted onto the rootstock of an Atropurpurum. They tend to have a better root system and helps the tree to grow and stay healthier if they don't use their original rootstock and they put them on the Atropurpurum. But this has some nice fall color. Now we're in the front yard looking off the mountain to the southeast. And we're looking at all the grasses that we've planted on this hill to help so that we don't have to mow here. And the first ones we're looking at are the pink mulky grass that I've just put in part of them this year. And then on the very end of that little patch are two white mulky grasses that are called alba. And behind that is a miscanthus, and I think it's Miscanthus sinensis, and then the one, the big one behind it is a zebra grass. And as the years have gone on, I've lost some of these tags, so I don't know exactly which grasses um, some of them are now. But there's one Japanese maple in a cage down here, and um, we keep it in a cage because the deer sometimes like to eat on them. And then we come around to the uh, pompous grass and it started as a little bitty grass up in a shady area when we bought the place and I have divided it three or four times, given it away several times. So um, if you need grasses, come to see me. <laughs> now we're looking at a bed on the south side and it's got a white beauty berry, which is Calicarpus americana in the front, and in the back is one of the purple ones, but it's not americana. I'm not exactly sure, but I thought you would enjoy seeing the white one. Now we're looking at a pyracantha that Bill has um, trained to grow along the fence and now it's coming through the sun. Now we're looking at a Japanese maple called Makawa Yatsubusa. Uh, the Yatsubusas are 
typically identified by the leaves so crunched together, put stacked together and up the branch. They don't really head off in separate branches on leaves, on stems. They just all pack together on the on the trunk up the up the bark. This maple we're looking at is Murasaki Kiyohime. He's a dwarf maple that, as you can see by the size of the trunk, he's got a few years on him. I would say he's a 20-year-old tree, um, and he's fully grown. He doesn't really get any taller. He's gotten a little wider over the last few years, but mainly he needs uh, he's trimming and shaping to uh, show off the inside structure. But he has a good fall color, and it's just now getting started. Well, just to wrap up with a few more, this is a vitifolium, uh, wonderful cirrusquanum type leaf, an excellent fall color going right now. Uh, here we have a Shadiva gold, uh, Acer palmatum that will turn gold, it's supposed to be gold in the fall, he's looking pretty orange to me. Uh, this one is a Acer bregarium, it's a trident type leaf maple it's from China and that's about all I can find out about it it was uh, a fellow in Winston-Salem sold it to us and, and he didn't know any more about it than I do well here we are uh, we just come from uh, Bill and Paula Phillips up on top of Barrett's Mountain we're now part of the way down Barrett's Mountain we saw a lot of bees up there on their flowers and uh, now we think we know where the bees came from they came from Danny Price's right here so Danny uh, uh, Danny Price is president of our Beekeepers Association, and he's going to show us a little bit about working in bees this time of year. And Danny, how many beehives do you have here? Um, I have approximately 30 some. I don't know exactly. It depends upon what time of the year, where you have 30 or where you have uh, 25, or sometimes you may have 40. It just depends upon whether you lose them or queen dies in them or something happens during the year. But we've got about 30 some right now, I think. So. Well, Danny's going to show us just a little bit about working in the hives, and we're going to get our cameraman Chad Ritchie in a suit to go up there and follow him around. We put my gloves on and uh, then we're ready to roll. I've got a, uh, this is a, a grip guard which grips the uh, frames. You put that and you grip the frames out with it. It's much easier than, uh, than just picking them up. I have a hard time just picking them up and carrying them sometimes so that just picks them up and you can look at the frames with those grip guards this is a hive tool here which is it uh, has many uses it pries the the cover off and you can scrape honey uh, wax and do all sorts of things with it. even got a nail puller on the end of it there that you can pull nails out if you had to right in there so. Okay, let's go down here. We'll go down here and uh, get in a, a, a nuke, and I'm going to take a sugar water, which I've mixed up 50-50, uh, 50% sugar and 50% water, and we're going to feed this hive of bees that uh, needs a little bit of sugar water in it, okay? This is the hive that we had at the fair this last year. I don't know if anybody was out at the fair. This is the, the hive that I had out there at the fair. Uh, I had uh, put some more frames in it because I had it down to five frames and now I've got nine frames in it right now and, and a feeder in it. And uh, this uh, They mostly just got honey up here on the top. They poured honey in here that I fed them with this feeder and they're storing it. You can see they're storing it to the outside and leaving a hole empty in the middle for the queen to lay her eggs in there if she needs to later on this year. So, so. This is a double uh, double nuke so you've got a nuke on the bottom and you got a, another nuke on top of it and uh, 
Usually if you take this, you can make a regular hive out of it later. Take one half of it, take all these nine frames out, and you put them in another um, regular hive body, which is just like this. That, that way you just build it up, then you start them on the other way if you want to take, a, take them down and put another, make you another hive with it. So. And here is the uh, feeder that's in there. It's a frame feeder. You pour the sugar water in up here in the middle. It goes down in here, and there's two little pieces of floats in there, which they float up as the as the honey or as the sugar water goes in there, and then the bees don't drown. So we'll fill that up in a minute. I'm going to check and see if the queen's doing all right in here, whether she's laying or, or not. So we'll pull a frame out of here and see if we can maybe even locate the queen here. Got to be real careful. If you don't, you may. You can see the pollen in there. See the pollen? The bee got pollen on it there. She's laying. There's eggs in there. If you can see them, it's their larva. You can see the larva hatching out right in here. A little, little white larva in there. I don't see her in there, but she's got larva right in that area, right in there. So she's in there all right. So. She should be on one of these frames right here. But right there she is. You see her? Got the white dot on her face right there. See her? She's right here capped over brood in here and she's laid in this pattern here so and she's got honey stored all around the outer edges here so that they can use that to raise young this winter so they'll be slacking off in this this pattern which is right in here we even get smaller as the winter as she gets closer in the winter they'll get smaller and more bees will get closer together see the pattern is here in the middle of summer now they'll have the bees will be all the way across. There'll be young bees all the way over to here, eggs all the way across here. And see, she's only laying in two frames right now. And in the summertime, she'll be laying in probably eight to 10 frames in there. So she's slowed down quite a bit. So I try to put that back down in there and make sure I know exactly where the queen is when I put it back so I don't damage her. Smoke is about going out. A little bit in there. What I'll do is I'm going to fill this up with sugar water right here. I mix this and it's ready to be poured in there. It's uh, consistency is a problem is going to be getting it in there probably. See, it'll hold about 
three quarters of a gallon. A little So we put it back in here. in there. I'm going to set this back on here. And we'll put your other frame back in it. And these will probably be all right. They've got honey in a couple of those frames there and this one here. That'll probably be enough honey to do them for a while we can check them later but they won't use quite as much as a, as a big hive of bees would if you had it okay now I've got some of these other ones here I've been feeding for a while these are are uh, plastic feeders they're just the bees can't get up here but they've got a the bees can crawl up in here and then crawl down inside here and they can eat on both sides of this you pour the the sugar water in here and then they come up and they don't have to they can without you can put this on without worrying about getting into the bees so you don't have to worry about it so what I try to do is pick up a hive of bees and just tell how much weight's involved in it. If you can't hardly pick it up, then you know that you, you're all right. Or you can pick up one side and tell if it's pretty heavy. If it's pretty heavy, you're all right. You don't need... That one there is in good shape. I fed it quite a bit. It's probably ready to take the, the feeder off of it. It's got enough, it's got enough stores in there. You should, should have about one super of honey for the bees to have enough to make it through the winter. And this is a super, and this is a brood chamber down here. Well, I hope you've learned to, to take care of bees. This is some of the things that you need to do this winter, and there's a lot of other things, but this will get you uh, started in taking care of your bees in the winter time, okay? Well, Danny, thanks for uh, showing us around today. Welcome. And uh, for some of you that may have some interest in uh, keeping some bees, maybe you're keeping some, or maybe you're just interested in learning, uh, we do have our uh, Alexander County Beekeepers Association, and Danny, tell us when that meets. Uh, our Beekeepers Association meets every uh, second, every month, the second Monday at 7 o'clock at the Extension Office in Taylorsville, right beside the uh, election, I guess the Board of Election there, if you don't know where that's at. So if you're interested, come on up. We have speakers. Uh, we try to get speakers every month. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we come out, uh, we've been out to my house here a couple of times, and, uh, and uh, we have uh, some people that if you need to get a mentor to help you with them, I'm sure some of these beekeepers would like to be glad to help you out in any way they could. So, so if you can, come out and join us on the second Monday night of each month. So thank you. And if you need directions or uh, just some other information, call Extension Office 632-4451. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the November garden calendar and uh, all that we've done today, talking about lawn chores and working in the garden, uh, pulling those weeds and old dead perennials and vegetable plants out of the garden, putting them in the compost. And you know, I hope you've enjoyed the uh, wonderful garden tour around the Phillips home. Uh, look at the many different wonderful plants they have and the Japanese maples. And then also learning a little bit about what goes on working with the beehives in the month of November. So um, come back and join us next month and uh, just wake me up come December.